Did you see the Cardi B tweet where she's asking people, when do you guys think they're going to announce that we're going into a recession? Now, that's funny because it's Cardi B, but if you think about it, it's actually a really good question. Who officially decides and then announces to the world that we are in a recession? Is it the Illuminati or is it Warren Buffett? The future is never clear. You pay a very high price in the stock market for a cheery consensus. Uncertainty actually is the friend of the buyer of long-term values or something like that. Now, there is actually a really good answer to this question because it comes down to what's called the BEA, which is the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Now, the BEA actually has a website that shows all of this information publicly, but nobody ever goes there and pays attention to it because they're not nerds like me. But here's how it works, because whether we're in a recession or not is measured by something called the GDP, which is the gross domestic product. And all that is, is a measure of the market value of all the stuff that a country makes per year. That's it. And it's measured in quarters, in blocks of three months. So four quarters per year, simple. Now here's where it's actually gonna blow your mind because these estimates are given to us three times each one being a little bit more accurate because it's really hard to measure the GDP, so they have to give us several estimates. Now, the first one is the one the market pays attention to the most because it's the one they spend the most time gathering all that data, and that's called the advance estimate. Now, this one is typically given four weeks after the first quarter ends. So for example, for this year's first quarter, which lasted from January to March, they gave us that GDP information on April 28th, exactly four weeks later. That's when the GDP results came in for that advance estimate. And in that report, they said that the GDP was negative 1.4%. And that scared investors, so they started selling off their stocks, their crypto, some real estate, because they're afraid of the dreaded recession. And a recession happens when we get two negative GDP reports back to back. Now here's the catch. These numbers don't have to be anything specific. They just have to be negative two quarters in a row and that's a recession, which is why they have to give us multiple estimates to make sure that it's as accurate as possible. But also because data doesn't come in all at once. It trickles in as corporations report earnings, taxes, and things like that. Which is why on May 26th, which has already happened, we got our second estimate for that first quarter. And in that new document, they basically said, guys, never mind, we're not down 1.4%. Actually, it's a little worse than we thought. We're down 1.5%. So this scared investors even more and they sold off a little bit more. That's how it works. Now on June 29th, we're gonna get our third GDP estimate for that first quarter. Now in that document, it could tell us that the GDP is even worse, which means the market will sell off even more. It could stay the same or it could improve, but chances are it's still gonna stay negative. Now June 29th will not tell us whether we're in a recession or not but here's exactly when we'll find out. That'll be at 8.30 a.m. on July 28th. That's when the BEA will release their second quarter advance estimate, and it's at that point we'll have judgment day. So let's cross our fingers and hope that we don't get a negative GDP, because if that's the case, first quarter was negative, and if second quarter is negative, that's the recession, and that's when the media will start telling us about it. So hopefully that answers Cardi B's question. So if you wanna help my channel, just tweet this video at her so she can watch it, because I know she does not watch my videos, but hopefully you will because I have some juicy new information on the market for you that hopefully explains where we are right now and where we could be going next. So let's get right into it. Hi, my name is Andre Jick. Hope you're doing well. Come for the finance and stay for unfortunately more bad news because this week, economist Robert Schiller just announced that he thinks there's a good chance that we're headed toward a recession and he's a Nobel laureate. What's a Nobel laureate? And that's someone whose research has had such a huge effect on society that they're awarded with a certificate, a medal, and a million dollars. In Robert Schiller's case, he was awarded the prize in 2013 for his empirical analysis of asset prices, and he's predicting a recession. This guy knows what he's talking about, but this led me down a rabbit hole to ask if there's anything we could use to predict that same information. And it just so happens that there is. It's something that estimates what our current GDP might be. And it's called the Atlanta Federal Reserve's GDP Now Tracker. Now, it's not an official measure of the GDP, but it uses the same exact technique to estimate what our economic growth level might be. 
Now, before I show you what it's predicting, I also wanted to make sure that it was accurate. Otherwise, what's the point? So here's the initial estimate from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and here's an overlay of the GDP Now tracker, and you can see just how close they are. So as far as accuracy is concerned, it's pretty accurate, and what they're predicting now is not looking too good, because on May 27th, their GDP prediction read 1.9%, which is good because it's not negative. But look how fast these numbers are changing, because as of June 1st, they revised their estimate to 1.3%. So we lost 0.6% in just a week. And now the numbers are looking even worse, because as of June 8th, they revised the estimate down even lower to 0.9%. So here's what that means. The good news is that the GDP prediction is not negative, which means no recession. That's great. The bad news is that their margin of error is 0.85%. So the real answer, whether we're gonna have a recession or not, could come down to a rounding error. We also still have roughly seven weeks to go before July 28th when we actually find out, but for now, the estimates keep going lower and lower. Now, the most interesting thing to me right now is whenever we talk about inflation and we see food prices, gas prices, hotels, cars, houses, everything go up and up, it reinforces this idea that we're going into a recession. But the truth is that a recession and inflation are not the same things. So sometimes when we believe something to be true, we can cause it to happen. And that's a bad thing because consumer spending is responsible for roughly 70% of the GDP. And that's a huge deal because whatever you believe will happen will affect how you spend your money. And if you look at Google Trend data, it shows that recession searches are growing. So it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy at this point. So if you believe there is a risk of a recession, then the first thing you're probably gonna wanna do is cut back spending and that makes sense, but that also lowers the GDP, which is obviously not good. So that's the first problem. The second problem problem this week is that the World Bank just issued a warning that we could be at a risk for a 1970s style recession. Now, for those of us like me who were not around in the 70s to know what that was even like, let me explain what that was like and show you the real risk of what the odds might actually be. So the first question I want to focus on is what the World Bank actually is and what's in it for them to tell us that we're on the brink of a recession because it sounds like some Illuminati business. But few people know this history that the World Bank was actually created to promote world peace. It's a collection of several institutions in 189 countries working together to help fund countries that have suffered as a result of global conflict. One of their goals is to help solve poverty and help fund developing countries so they can build out their infrastructure. So they're basically the Avengers Initiative. The World Bank is Nick Fury, Captain America is Bank of America, Wells Fargo is Black Widow, Goldman Sachs is Iron Man, and JP Morgan Chase is... You get the idea. Now the World Bank is not a typical bank that you and I would use as consumers, but it does have a really cool place in history because it was created during what's called the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, which was followed by something else you might've heard of called the IMF, the International Monetary Fund on December 27th, 1945. But the reason the World Bank was created is because it is thought that the way countries treated Germany after the first global conflict forcing Germany to pay for all the damages, which made Germany be like, that's not fair, what the heck, is what partially led to the second global conflict. And the World Bank exists to prevent that from happening in the future. And I thought that was kind of cool. Smash the like button if you did too. Now here's the little nugget that the World Bank dropped on us this week, because they said last year the world grew by about 5.7%. At the beginning of this year in January, they expected the world to grow by 4.1%, but now they're saying that the world will actually grow maybe closer to 2.9%. Now, they said that advanced economies, such as the one here in the US, on average will maybe grow by 2.6% in 2022 and 2.2% by 2023. And the reason they're giving us these lower estimates is because of the conflict in Ukraine. There's slower investment activity, slower trade activity, and the pent up demand from staying at home has already been released because the economy is open and because the tools of the monetary and fiscal policy are not accommodative, which if you remember are tools from the government and the central bank, because their priority is to bring down inflation, which comes at the cost of increasing the risk of a recession. In fact, the World Bank president just said, for many countries, a recession will be hard 
hard to avoid. So all in all, obviously not a good sign. It doesn't inspire investor confidence when we hear stuff like this, which is why the market is up one day, it's down the next, but also why it's mostly selling off. But the thing that as investors really worried right now is that the World Bank is also warning people that we could experience 1970s style stagflation. And that's something else completely. And here's exactly what that means. Stagflation is when you get inflation, in other words, the rising cost of stuff combined with real wage growth being negative or an increase to unemployment along with the GDP going down, in other words, the country making less stuff. And that has happened before in the 1970s and it was not a good time. And now the World Bank is telling us that we could be at the risk for that happening again. And they gave three main reasons why today looks kind of like it did in the 70s. Number one, we have persistent supply side disruptions, which helps fuel inflation thanks to the Roni Rona. In certain parts of the world, we still have not fixed shipping, which is not helping. Number two, ever since we dropped rates to zero, people went out to get that cheap money. They spent the money, which spiked the GDP. But now that interest rates are up, the GDP and the economy is swimming upstream. So obviously people want to borrow less, they want to spend less, which obviously means the GDP is going to go down. And number three, our Papa Pal is committed to raising interest rates no matter what the cost is just to bring down inflation, which makes perfect sense. But that's not helping because it's also coming at a time where it's hurting developing countries. And that's because we made it so that they need our dollars to do business with, right? So when we hurt, the rest of the world hurts too. It's kind of cruel irony that's coming back to bite us in the butt. So today we're kind of faced with the same choices as we were in the 1970s. Do we slow down inflation by increasing interest rates, thus hurting the economy? Or do we allow rampant inflation to exist, but potentially hurt employment? That's the choice we have to make and neither one is good. But in the 70s, the way they solved the problem was their Papa Powell, who was Papa Volcker, increased their interest rates to 14% to fight their inflation of 14% but that sent them into a recession, after which point they increased the interest rate even more to almost 20%, sending them into another recession and hurting their economy. Now, where stagflation comes in is this, because remember, when inflation runs hot and everything goes up, wages actually go up too, which is why in the 1970s, actually toward the late 70s, early 80s, wage growth reached a peak of almost 8%. Now, that sounds great, but that turns out to be a real wage growth of negative 6% when facing the 14% inflation. So basically it's the same as saying, what good is giving people a dollar raise if the cost of food, gas, and everything else goes up by $2? That's stagflation. Now to some degree, that's happening already, but here's some good news. Unlike the 1970s, today our dollar is very strong. And that's a good thing for us as consumers because that means that we have purchasing power in relation to the global goods we import. If we had a weak dollar like we did in the 1970s, then the stuff we import would be a lot more expensive, which would contribute to higher inflation. Also, commodity prices fluctuate a lot less now than they did in the 70s, but most importantly, because we've lived through the 70s, we're now more experienced and smarter as a result, and we know what not to do, which is to avoid price controls like we did in the 1970s, which is also to avoid government subsidies, which leads to corporations increasing their prices because if they know, hey, the government's gonna pay for this, what does it matter? I'm gonna increase my prices. That leads to inflation. And to avoid export bans, which leads to even more inflation. In other words, we have a manual that says, remember how we did that and it didn't work? Let's not do that again. For now, the economy is balanced at the tip of a spear. The edge of a knife and no one knows exactly which way it's gonna fall because it could go either way. So for now, I'm still investing in the market. I'm still dollar cost averaging into the S&P 500, still buying Bitcoin every day, but I'm also a little heavier on my cash position. But the real date to really remember and mark on your calendar is July 28th. That's when we'll know whether we're in a recession or not. But I will say this, if it turns out that the GDP is positive, then that's a good thing because at that point, we would reset the counter to zero. It's at that point that the earliest that we could get into a recession would be at the end of the year or beginning of next year. Because remember, it takes two quarters, which lasts six months. Let's cross our fingers for that positive GDP result. Trying my best to give you as much information as possible into a condensed video, but I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that it takes me anywhere between eight to 12 hours to research alone for these 10 minute short videos, not to mention the editing and shooting and everything else. But as always, have a wonderful rest of your day. Smash the like button, subscribe, 
subscribe if you haven't already. Go grab up to $250 worth with this link right here, and then go grab your free stocks. Links down below, go track them with the spreadsheet linked down below in my Patreon automatically. So as always, love you. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you back here on Monday and Friday, sometimes a Wednesday. Bye-bye.